I am in a series called, Can You Relate? Everybody say that, can you relate? relate. You probably heard from me and other people that the only thing you take into eternity with you are your relationships. That's all that you're left with. At the end of the day, all of the stuff that you possessed, all of the money that you had, all of the things that you did, all come together to feed the one thing that matters, the finished product of planet Earth, and that's people. Jesus died for people. Your relationships are so so huge. We probably should put it up again. You guys have seen it so many times, but the fountain is, you know, the idea is the water comes up through the center. It fills the top bath, which overflows to the next bath, which overflows to the next bath. And that's your relationships. It begins with God and then it affects you. Then it affects your family. Then it goes on down, in fact, all the way to the world. But it has to begin with God. That's what we talked about last week. Romans 14, 17 says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Righteousness is your relationship with God. You're given the gift of righteousness righteousness so you can relate to God. Peace, what I'm going to talk about today, is your relationship with yourself. Being able to lay your head on your pillow at night and not be overwhelmed by all the fear and all the nonsense that's going on. But peace, a peace that Jesus gave you that the world doesn't have. A peace that goes right into your heart that's a gift from the Lord. Joy is a consequence of fellowship. So think about it. God, yourself, and others. Righteousness is your relationship with God. Peace is your relationship with yourself. And joy is a consequence of fellowshipping with people. How many of you know people? That when you hang out with them and then you leave, you're just encouraged. How many know there's an other side of that coin too? <laughs> Isn't that right? And so there's just some people that just fill your life. And joy comes from hanging out with people, just laughing with people. I said it last week. The greatest thing in my life is to hear Becky laugh, to hear my grandkids laugh. I can just, just, just laugh just because they're laughing. Amen. I love to be in fellowship with people who love me and so do you. So we talked last week about the one, the most important thing. You know, Jesus had the one, the three, the 12, the 70. He loved everybody the same, but they weren't all as close as they could be. Some were closer. He took the three everywhere he went. When he went on the Mount of Transfiguration, he took Peter, James, and John. If I would have been a couple of those other guys, I would have said, what's up with that? Why'd you leave me at the foot of the mountain to wrestle with this demon and this little boy here? But you you get the story. Not everybody has the same relationship with God. You are as close to God as you want to be. You are as close as you want to be. You make the choice. Amen. Here's what it says in Jeremiah 30. I'm just reviewing, so these aren't going to be on the screen. One of my favorite scriptures in the world is from the NIV, Jeremiah 30, verse 21. Their leader will be one of their own. Their ruler will arise from among them. I will bring him near and he will come close to me for who is he who will devote himself to be close to me. Everybody say me. Who is he who will devote himself to be close to me? Your relationship with God determines the flavor and depth of every other relationship. If you get that one wrong, you don't have the power to do all the rest of them. I'm going to say that again. Your relationship with God determines the flavor and depth of every other relationships. Your human relationships don't have the capacity to rise above your relationship with God. Your relationship with God sets the table for every other relationship in your life. Isn't that good? Wow. Your relationship with God actually gives you the resources that you need to be a blessing to someone else. Otherwise, you're digging out of your head to be a blessing to someone. You're trying to encourage someone out of your brain. I don't have the capacity to to do that. I wish I did, but I don't. Again, here's another scripture. This is last week. It's free online, by the way. If anyone claims, 1 John 2, I'm living in the light but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. And then it says this in 1 John 4, and it's so important that you get this. We love each other because he loved us first. The love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, Romans 5, 5. When you became a Christian, God put his love on the inside of you and it can come out of you if you want it to. 
Or you can block it up. You can put a dam there and stop that flow of love if you want to, but you don't have to work. It's there. If you just naturally let the love of God flow through you, God loves people through you. We love because he first loved us. I love Becky because God loves me. I love you because God loves me. If I didn't know that, I'd be really suspicious of you. Even Becky. <laughs> we love each other because he loved us first. Wow, I could stop there and that's pretty good. We love each other because he loved us first. The question is, do you know that? Are you living in the light of that? Do you have a revelation of God's perspective of you? Do you really know sincerely in your heart, this is what, think, what God thinks about when he thinks about me. Do you believe that when God thinks about you, he smiles? I can literally be talking about my grandkids and I'll smile. I can be thinking about my grandkids and smile. What if you believed that was God's perspective about you? How would your life be different if you knew that you knew that you knew that God loved you? Wow, everybody say wow. wow. Are you biblically self-aware? So the thing I'm gonna talk about today, the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the next step, believe it or not, which is you, loving yourself. The thing that happens after you have an, a relationship with God is how your life then reflects that relationship. What impact does it have on you and how do you see yourself? Because your relationship with God affects how you relate to everybody else, but it has to be based on the fact that I know God loves me and my identity is secure because of that love of God. Everybody say myself. Your identity determines how you love others. How many of you guys have ever had an identity crisis? I'm going to give you one more chance to redeem yourself. <laughs> How many of you guys have ever had an identity crisis? You all had an identity crisis. They always talk about, you know, after junior high, after high school, after college, midlife. I never have had a midlife crisis, but I did have a yellow sports car, so I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know. But there's a time when you're just saying, who am I? Why am I here? And if you're not secure in who you are, it'll affect how you treat everyone else. You see everyone else through your lens. You see everyone else through your lens. Here's what it says in Matthew 22. Teacher, what is the most important commandment? Matthew 22, 36. What is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Leave that up for, for a second. Love your neighbor as yourself. What does that mean? Your love for your neighbor can never go beyond your identity and your acceptance, your self-awareness of, of yourself and the fact that God loves you. Just like you're limited to knowing the love of God, you're limited by not being secure in who you are. If you think you're a doofus, You'll treat a lot of other people like they're a doofus, even when they're not. Is, a, is that a word? Do we make that up in Missouri? Everybody say doofus. <laughs> Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. I woke, woke up this morning thinking, it's really odd that I would be thinking this. Why are 15-year-old boys killing themselves in record numbers. I don't just mean 15. Teenagers are killing themselves in record numbers. And I was thinking, how do I impact my grandkids and the people I know so that they grow up secure? Little boys are committing suicide, not little boys, but teenagers are committing suicide. Boys, four times more than girls. And I woke up this morning thinking, why is that? When I was 15, I was happy as a lark. I had some issues. Turns to me and say, he still does. But I just kept thinking, what is it? What is it? What is it about that, that age group and boys that, that they're feeling so insecure and their identity is being determined by social media in comparison with other people and competing with other people and all the crazy foolish things that the world is saying right now is not being counteracted with the truth of the word of God. And so people are, are growing up believing a lie and it's having an incredible negative impact. Amen? Amen? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Think about the scripture that says, forgive even as you're forgiven. 
Show mercy even as you receive mercy. Your identity has to be secure before you can love effectively. Your relationships are going to be determined by who you think God is and who you think you are. Amen? How do you see yourself? If you see yourself flawed, you judge everyone else in the light of that flaw that you see in yourself. 2 Corinthians 3 says this. I can say this about all the scriptures, but this again is one of my favorite scriptures. <laughs> I just like the Bible. How about that? 2 Corinthians 3.16. By the way, it goes right into 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. How many of you know the original scripture didn't have chapter and verse? Many times you're reading something, you need to jump right through into the next chapter because it's carried on. So in verse 16, it says, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. Other translations say things like behold and reflect. You reflect the glory of the Lord to the degree that you behold it. The clearer you see the picture of God, the more that's reflected out of your life. So all of us who've had that veil removed can see and reflect. Everybody say see and reflect. You have to see it before you reflect it. See and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. We're made more and more like Jesus. Our identity is, is being changed and transformed continually as we behold Jesus. Therefore, since God in His mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. We never give up. We reject all shameful deeds and underhanded methods. We don't try to trick anyone or distort the Word of God. We tell the truth before God and all who are honest know this. If the good news we preach is hidden behind a veil, it's hidden only from people who are perishing. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They, not us, but they, are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. You see, we don't go around preaching about ourselves. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. He's saying as we preach Jesus, we as a byproduct reflect Jesus. I don't have to lift myself up. I just have to know him and stay close to him. And the byproduct of that is I will reflect the truth about him. Amen. For God who said, let there be, let light, there be light in darkness has made this light shine in our hearts so we can know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. So what should be your focus? The face of Jesus Christ, the life of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. So there's a combination there of humility, not making yourself something because you're a good basketball player or you look good or you have money or anything else. You don't rely on that. You don't rely on the flesh. So there's that humility but the other side of it is, you don't want a false humility. You want to say, who did God say I am? What does God say about Terry? What does God say that I'm capable of? So you've got to find that balance of saying, my identity is in Jesus. My life, the Bible says in Colossians 3, 3, is hidden in Christ, in God. My life is hidden. Where? You want to find your life? It's hidden. It's a treasure. You're a treasure chest. You want the treasure? You got to find Jesus. Your life is wrapped up in Jesus. Isn't that right? You always hear the story, but it's so good. Jesus walking along with his disciples. And he says, who do people say I am? They say, some say this, some say that. And he said, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And Peter, of all people, said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, why? You didn't get that from, from earth. That came from heaven. And by the way, you're a rock, Peter. You used to be swayed in the wind. But you're Peter, you're a rock. Peter found himself when he discovered the truth about Jesus. The more you look in the mirror for you, the harder it is to find you. You ain't going to find yourself in your wallet or your garage or your mirror. Amen. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? You are not there. You're just not there. That's what the world says. What you possess, what you've done, you know, who you are, how you were born, your bank account, all of those things. But this says your life, your real life 
And that's what it says in the NLT. I love it. Your real life is hidden with Christ in God. So as you discover the truth about Jesus, without even trying to, you're transformed into his image. And you begin to believe the truth about who you are according to what God said. You don't have to have a cheerleader say, you can do it, rah, rah, rah. I love to be encouraged. I love when people tell me, you know, things. Somebody gave me a really encouraging word this morning. I got a, some this week in Colorado. Great word from the Lord. It's encouraging. I like it. Everybody say, me too. But you know what? My true identity and your true identity has to come out of your heart and say, this is, this is what God says about me. Wow. Preach it. Amen. I find that inferiority complexes or other identity issues cause people to run from their perception of themselves. They run from who they think they are in the world. I remember being that goofy guy, trying to find myself out there, and I never did. And so what happens is when people can't find themselves, they start medicating themselves. So the question is, what are you medicated, medicating and how are you medicating it? You know, that can be alcohol, that can be drugs, that can be the opposite sex, that can be so many, that can, that can be 12 hours of Netflix. That can be anything like that. What are you medicating? What if you, it was so good, I was in, in a meeting this week and my TV didn't work. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> so, so I'm thinking, I'm just gonna not watch any news. And it was debate night, so life is good. I didn't see it. <laughs> and so uh, I was just thinking about how easy it is for me to get distracted into something just to fill my head when the, the world, the flesh, and the devil are trying so hard to keep you from being still in the presence of God. Being still and knowing that he is God. If you've forgotten that he is God, you might need to be still. Amen, you okay? What are you medicating? How are you medicating it? Ephesians 1. Boy, I tell you what, there's so much in Ephesians. You should just read the whole book. I'm just going to highlight some stuff. But it says, verse 4, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Verse 11 says, furthermore, because we're united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God for he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan. Verse 13 said, he identified you as his own. He looks at you no matter what the world says and says, they belong to me. Yeah, they're mine. Amen. Sometimes your parents maybe didn't want to claim you in a few situations. But they did, right? He identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit whom he promised long ago. Chapter 2, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. I was riding on an airplane this week. And I wrote this down. I'm not going to say it's a word from the Lord, but it came to me very strongly. My ultimate for you is to redeem you to be the full expression of my creation in you. That is spiritually, socially, physically, and emotionally uninhibited by the expectations and opinions of others. Do you have the courage to be you or will you be limited by those around you and a desire to present something other than who you are? Do you trust my creation of you or are you going to keep trying to make yourself a counterfeit of my design for you? I'm going to read that again because I didn't think it was just for me. But think about this. My ultimate for you is to redeem you to be the full expression of my creation in you. You know what that means with your personality, with your hair, with you, with, with your humor, you, the way God made you. And so many times, and rather than accepting that we're made in God's image, we keep trying to create this perspective as if we can create better than God, rather than accepting who he made us to be. Sometimes I've not liked who I am, but the older I've gotten, the more I just said, you know, Popeye was right. I am what I am, and that's all that I am. <laughs> Amen. I'm going to read that again, though. My ultimate for you is to redeem you to be the full expression of my creation in you. That is spiritually, socially, physically, and emotionally uninhibited by the expectations and opinions of others. The expectations and opinions 
of other people don't hold the weight of God's expectations and opinions of you. Do you have the courage to be you or will you be limited by those around you and a desire to present something other than who you are? Do you trust my creation of you or are you going to keep trying to make yourself a counterfeit of my design for you? Everybody say, I don't want to be a counterfeit. There was a church father who made an incredible statement, Irenaeus. The glory of God is a human being fully alive. So we got to ask the question, what does it mean to be fully alive as a person that's following Jesus Christ? What should be the impact of my relationship with him? And how does it change me? And how do I think about myself and other people in light of who he now said I am? Because of the price Jesus paid to get you, how does that change your value of yourself? And again, I know people, you know, for every mile of road, there's two miles of ditch. You know, over here, they're at this extreme. Then over here, they're haughty and arrogant. He's not saying be haughty or arrogant. He's saying, think the truth about yourself. Apply the truth of who you are. You're seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father. You couldn't make that up. I mean, that's amazing stuff, isn't it? Everybody say, wow. Be yourself, somebody said, because everyone else is taken. Isn't that good? Be yourself because everyone else is taken. What if you could look in the mirror? You know, remember in school, they would say, when you grow up, who do you want to be like? You say, I want to be like so-and-so. I want to be like an astronaut. I want to be like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I want to be like so-and-so. Is there ever a time when you look in the mirror and say, I really like who God made you to be. I'm really happy with you. You're not doing everything perfectly, but I'm delighted in God's creation in you. Can you do that? So I think, isn't it wrong to do that? No, it's right to do that. As long as you're thinking biblically from that perspective and not in the world's point of view. Amen. Amen. You need a place to share your secrets. If you want to become fully alive, you need a place to share your secrets. Chris Hodges said, you're only as sick as your secrets. The Bible says we're going to give an account for our secret life. So I've decided I'm just going to shoot that secret life and just it shouldn't even exist. I don't want to give an account for it. So I don't want to have a secret life. Integrity is when there's just one of you. Duplicity is when there's two of you. If there's two of you, merge this morning so that there's only one of you. How do you do that? You, you come clean. You get honest before God. And it's interesting. It says in James 5, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. When you sin and you say, Father, forgive me, he does it instantly. But you know what? Sometimes next week you do the same thing again. And next week you do the same thing again. Why? Because you didn't get healed. How many know there's a difference between forgiveness and healing? Confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. You need a relationship with God, a relationship with yourself, but you need a friend that you trust, that you can tell anything to. I always remember Wayne Cordero in Hawaii said he would come home and he would say, you know, I think uh, he'd tell his wife, I think my, one of my board members is demon possessed. And he's just blah, 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 blah. And then she would go to church and snarl at this guy. And so Wayne went up and said, what are you doing? Why are you mad at him? And she said, well, you told me. Blah, blah, blah. He said, well, yeah, but we got that all fixed. We talked to each other. It's all gone. No problem. But he just didn't tell her. He said, so what I discovered was I had to find some lightning rods, some people that I could go to and talk to with no hiding. People say, can you do this as a Christian? Yes. Find somebody you trust. How do you do that? Get in a band. Becky's overseeing the ladies' bands. Jim Kenzie's overseeing the men's bands. I'm in a band. On Wednesday nights, I'm in a band. On Wednesday nights, she's in a band. What's a band? It's three people of the same sex getting together and being accountable to each other. It's good to be in a small group. I'm in several small groups. I'm in a prayer small group. I'm in a task group with the staff. But I'm in a band where I let down my guard to say, here's the truth. Not that I'm lying. It's just, that, okay, here's the real me. Here's what's going on. I can trust you. This is not going out of this room. 
we're going we're gonna to pray for each other. And we're going to be very honest about what's going on. I don't know that you can really reach full discipleship without something like that where you can be yourself. I'm going to pause and let that sink in because there's a, there's a real atmosphere in here right now. <laughs> I'm not sure you can reach your potential. You say, well, I tell my family that. Well, I tell Becky. I, I can't imagine telling her anymore, but there's still, even though I have a very, very, very good marriage, we have a good marriage. We really do. We talk, she wants me to shut up sometimes. I tell her so much stuff. But even in light of that, family isn't the same as going to someone outside of your family and saying, I struggle with this. You know, I, uh, I got six minutes. So I went to, you guys know this story. I went to Lowe's. Everybody say, I know this story. <laughs> About two months ago. And um, Becky and I were going to go from Lowe's to the gym or somewhere in the city. And so I was just walking in Lowe's. And some guy walked up to me and hit me like this and knocked me over to the next aisle. And I said, excuse me? And his wife turned around like, what, what was that about? And then another guy standing there said, well, that was strange. I said, yeah, some people just aren't very happy. I don't even know the guy. And so I just prayed, went to my truck and prayed. And, we're, and I had probably three days, I would say, why do you think he did that? She's like, shut up. <laughs> Like, what was this guy doing? Did I know him? Is that somebody I didn't know? What's going on? And then I'm thinking, you know what? I could have got him right around the neck and taken him down. <laughs> you said, Pastor Terry, did you think that? Twice. <laughs> I was thinking of a couple of maneuvers from the back just to say, I'm, I don't want to hurt you, but man, come on. You said, can you say that? Yeah, it's, it's real. That's truth. Or you can lie and be a fake Christian if you want. So I never think things like that. Well, you sweet little thing, I don't believe you. <laughs> you got stuff. And that's what a lot of Christians are faking it because they're like, I'm the only guy. Nobody else is like this. Nobody else thinks like this. Yes, we do. Tell somebody. You can get over it, but you can't do it by yourself. Forgiveness comes from, from God, but healing comes from being with people. Jesus had the three, the band. Jesus was in a band. Think about it. Peter, James, and John. He was closer to them than he was even the 12. I think that's amazing. In my notes, there's a lot of stuff about the bands, where they came from in uh, Wesley's revival in England. Uh, you can have my notes for free, terry at fcfc.tv, but I'm not going to read all this stuff. It's some great stuff. If your life is going to really reflect Jesus, you have to become transparent to God and a few friends. Somebody said the unexamined life is not worth living. Service Christianity hears sermons and then ponders them to see what they want to do. Real discipleship opens up its life to other people and gets challenged and is accountable, gives an account for how it's doing with it. Again, Becky's doing women's bands. Jim Kenzie's doing men's bands. Get with them. Amen. Boy, that's good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you a really deep biblical song, right? The great hymn writer that wrote the Cheers song. I just, every time I talk about small groups, I just, I go back to this song. It's not biblical. I'm kidding. But I think about how this, how this relates to your life, your need to be around people. It says, making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see the troubles are all the same. We have a culture of being in a small group in our church because I don't believe you can reach your potential here without it. You say, well, I just come on Sunday morning. Thank you for coming. That ain't enough. I ain't that good. I'm telling you the word, but this is not where disciples are made. I cannot disciple you from here. If this is all you do, I cannot disciple you from here. Jesus preached to the multitude. Then he took the 12 aside and said, do you guys get that? That makes sense to you? And they, they ask him questions. You need that publicly and house to house, Paul said. You need both. You need a place where you can be yourself. You can be honest. And if, first of all, you get honest with God about who you are. But then in light of you discovering and becoming self-aware biblically of who you are, then you're such a blessing to the people around you. Not just what you preach to them, but just you. I can mention so many people in this church who don't preach, but in, incredibly encourage me with their life. 
You know what? Maybe you'll never preach. But what if your life just lifted the people around you? What if you just lived this? Paul said, whatever you saw me do, whatever you heard me say, put it into practice. Amen. He said, my life should be a model for your life. Follow me while I follow Christ. Isn't that amazing? Let me close with a scripture. Acts 2. Here's the culture of the early church. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and to the fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all, them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. That wasn't communism. That was free will offerings. They did it because nobody was taking their stuff. They were giving it. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals, and you could say, and their lives, with great joy and generosity, or some translations say with sincerity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And the Lord, each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who are being saved. You are a treasure in an earthen vessel. Help us help you. Bring it out. Where are you getting your identity? I was thinking of that show. Come out, come out wherever you are. Come out. You say, if I let the real me out, you might not like me. We probably will like it better than we like you now. We'd rather see the you that God's creating than the you that you're creating. Now, that doesn't give you the right or permission to be ugly or say goofy things. If you say goofy things, that's a sin. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying, what if you let down your guard? What if you did that? I think you'd be an incredible blessing to someone, to us. Amen. I could just scream this. Please be who God made you to be. Stop trying to be somebody else. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, I pray for everyone that's here today. I thank you for the grace of God just being released into our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that we grow and we're changed as we know the truth about you and the truth about us, and it affects us in our relationship with others. And Lord, we're so grateful that you sacrificed so much to give us this life, Lord. Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, just in case you're here this morning and you've never made the decision to step over that line and say, Jesus, I believe that you died for me. I believe the gospel. Well, that's great to believe it, but you gotta take the next step and say, I want that. I'm willing to turn from my sin and myself and turn to you, Lord. I want the forgiveness that you offer because of the cross. You died for me. You were raised from the dead. Why wouldn't I receive that free gift? I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And if you mean it from your heart, you can get born again right now. Now we'll say this. I want you to come next week and get baptized in water as a public testimony. But you can get born again right now because everyone that calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you believe it and you want to pray this, say this, Father, in Jesus' name, I belong to you. I believe Jesus went to the cross for me. I trust you, Lord. Only you can make me new. And I receive that today in Jesus' name. Amen.